Good day viewers. Welcome to another edition of 30 Minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. I'm Manir Dan Ali. My guest today is a professor of virology, Professor Oyewale Tomori, who studied at Ahmadu Bello University, Zaria, and the University of Ibadan, where he became a professor more than 50 years ago. He's been, he's made a name as somebody who has a lot of knowledge and insight into viral diseases, viral infections, whether it is uh, Lassa fever, whether it is uh, the latest one, the COVID that we've had, and many other ones. Professor Tomori, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be here. Thank you. You are also a vice chancellor, which you left more than 10 years ago, of the Redeemers University in Ogun State, yes. one of the faith-based universities in Nigeria. Um, was it in any way different being a university administrator when all your life you've been more or less a researcher, a WHO, that is World Health Organization, uh, specialist on viral disease for the West Africa region? Yeah, it wasn't really much because for the first 25 years I was within the university system before I joined the WHO. So it was just a return to things I've done before. Although when I was in UI, I wasn't really much into administration. Maybe I ended up just as the head of department. Uh, after head of department, it's more like election. And, and I wasn't yes, political too, appointment. Yeah, more or less. More or less. Yes. I wasn't too excited about having to go and campaign for any position. But as a head of the department, it was something everybody who became a professor becomes a head of the department. Thereafter, you're on your own politically and campaign ways, all sorts of things. That I wasn't interested in that. So eventually, I ended up with WHO. And I was invited by the uh, general vice of the regime church. I mean, I'm a the church, so to come you in. You are a pastor? Or yes, you are I am. Not? Okay, you are I a pastor. I am a pastor. And you also profess from the pulpit? You yes, sure. I mean, we had the we, by churches that we started in the Badon. Uh, as the One of the ones we started, that's where I still attend now. Although I'm there as an elder, you know, <laughs> you know, there are younger people who are in there. Yes. So it was that that I got back to come and assist in. Uh, as a pioneer vice chancellor at the Redeemers University. The universities were, I mean, it should be the same, but then part of the problems we had, like I used to tell people, the 10 years I took outside, I knew we had problems in Nigeria, but I didn't know that it had gone that bad. So That's coming the back- 10 years in the university, you mean? Yeah, university, in the country in general, right. there were that kind of thing. Uh, so when I went away for 10 years, I uh, kind of lost touch a bit with what was going on, only occasionally hearing about the country. But when I then came back to start the join as a pioneer vice chancellor, I thought I've met a lot of things that I didn't expect, you know. That is people lobbying you for admissions I mean, and all sorts of things, people it was, who haven't met any of the qualifications and, or criteria. Exactly, and you'll expect that in a religious court university, that kind of thing shouldn't happen. But we, there was not much of a difference. People still lobbied. People don't deserve to lobby. But I think we were glad from onset that we set our own standard and said we had only one list, and it's called the marriage list. There was no vice chancellor. You don't have list. the mm. subsidiary mm. list, mm. the no, VCs list, no maybe the pastors no, list, no, or the general overseers, no general overseers list. list. It was just one single list, and it was the merit list. We took you by your score. And if somebody didn't, didn't make it, I mean, or didn't accept the offer, the next in line gets it, not jump in the line. You know? So that was the way we did it, you know. And at first they thought it was impossible, it was. But it requires you being personally involved in it. But soon we did it two or three years, other people then found that yes, it was possible. One of the things that older people probably like you may find strange is that there are so many first class from this especially the private universities, unlike in your days when probably it's once in a generation you get a first class uh, result. 
you, you know, the way things were done in those days, I mean, you were just were discussing, we're talking about the internet age and things of that nature. Uh, in those days, uh, things were done purely. You got to the library, you got your book, you read it, you made notes. Now they, they do not even have to visit the library. They can just go on the internet and get all that information you, you had. When I came back, I actually was taking some courses. But I quickly realized that uh, I had to change Your knowledge them. was a yeah, bit outdated exactly. or, or your yeah. methods. Exactly. And I keep telling them, look, you know, you have great opportunity to go to the internet because I don't have that much time. So we're both learning. And so, you know, when I teach from my experience, which you don't have, you upgrade mine with your own because you are faster on the internet than myself. So we bring the two together to get so something even you much yourself, better. you adapted to the times. You have to, otherwise you will become a dinosaur, you know, in a system like that, you know. Back to your question, it's uh, about whether the number of first class, really I don't think so. Because there are standards that are set. You have to have this level of GPA or whatever uh, before you can become a first class. And like I mentioned, the way things are now, it's knowledge. I, I'm, not, I'm a bit sorry to say that our university system is more like teach and regurgitate. And so if they can get it faster than you, of course they will get the, the, this number. We've never really used our university system to address the problems of our country. Actually, that's where I want to go, that is the university connected with the larger society, with its needs, with the challenges and with the ambitions of the very energetic young people who want a degree? Unfortunately, no. Maybe now some of our universities are, I mean, now the NUC is now asking universities to have a certain percentage of the courses they are running being run as the university. They call it, I think, CCM or whatever, which was different from those days. Each university in those days was told, you run this course, and 10 of us are running the same course, you know, giving the same degree in geology, geography and all that. But now, there's been some independent being given to universities. I think that's a good step. Then each university can then look around this environment and say, what are the things that I need to address? What are the problems that are there that I need to address? And what can I use science and research to do? We weren't doing that much. In, in, in those days. But now with this system, I think our university will then become more relevant to the environment where they are. And that would be the, re the, the reason for why they are there in the first place. But we still see most of the universities, private, public, they are still doing those traditional subjects, BA, this and that, from languages to history, to geography, to whatever. And this is the IT age mm. where many think that should be what is emphasized. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's going to take some time to move away from what was the tradition to now. You, you keep adapting. You remember when I said, even when I'm teaching, when I go back, I, I had to catch up with the internet myself. Yes. So it also takes that individual within the university themselves to see that, look, we are here for a purpose. If they don't realize the purpose of what they are, they will still remain in the same system they are. But when you then begin to see and ask yourself questions, what is this university for? What's my value to my society? And then you then take advantage of what is around you. So I, I see our universities moving in that direction. Uh, I, but I think we'll be too slow. I mean, in my own way, like Muslims in this country, uh, a, a, hundred yards, a hundred meters dash, we turn into a marathon. And that's the problem. And it's a lot of pain. What you should have done within a short time, you're taking that long. Uh, all sorts of problems keep coming. Additional problems come, and you have to battle with that. Right now, if you have sorted it out once and for all, then you, 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 you have no more problem. Take the issue of COVID and things of that nature. You give advice to government quite a lot of times. So let's do this and say, oh, no, no, no. And then because they didn't take your advice, it created other problems. They're not asking you to come and solve those problems. In Africa, if you had done what we told you two weeks ago, we won't have this problem now. So I think we need to get to a point in Nigeria to think differently. You but know. then, back to even the universities, yes. something too many of them have been uh, established, private ones especially, and then members of the National Assembly, it looks like it's a Me Too competition. There is university in this place, we have to bring a bill and establish another in my own senatorial zone or House of Representatives zones. And it's still the same pool of teachers 
who tend to be moonlighting all over. Is that good for I, I gave a talk to, well, you don't want the lectures I gave, and, and the NGC was quite mad with me about it. And I said exactly what you said. We don't have, we're not planning. Before you establish a university, you must look at where am I going to get the teachers? Where am I going to get this? Where am I going to get that? I mean, if you don't do that, you're going to you know, start getting from the old places, which are not enough in the first place. And then you create more problems for yourself. I think we're creating too many universities in this country. And that, whether we like it or not, we could have found money to expand those ones, to take in more students. It would probably be cheaper, better than creating, sorry to use the word, mushroom universities all over the place, which uh, for the first three or four or five years, how many are they admitting? You know, when you look at the admission for all those universities, when they start, you maybe take, there was a university that had only three or four students in the first year they came out. So perhaps we'll have spent more time improving the ones we have, you know, and then doing a proper study. When do we need this? And not only that, the world is moving in this direction. What kind of people do we want uh, to train? And then we should adapt our universities, and not just that, but kind of you mentioned going to the House of Assembly as if uh, uh, setting up university is like making pure water or something of that nature, or is a consistency achievement. You know, I've set up university in my, my zone. Or something. That, but they, you, they argue in a yeah. counter way that, look, the Nigeria's population is so big, so there is still, and then uh, the public universities can only, or the, even the total existing universities, mm. can only take a small fraction of those who sit for the jam exams and all of that. Isn't that an argument for more? Two, two things we need to take. Your population, you have to, you, the way our population is increasing, you cannot say you're going to increase the university according to the population. If you're not putting control, if you're not putting some kind of measure, into the way our population is going. It's exploding in different places. Advanced countries are looking at different ways to control their population. I mean, some of them have done it over, and they're now going back to whatever. But until they got to that level, take some of the things we do, where Nigeria never seems to make any headway. Take the SDG, um, whatever you listen. It's a matter of percentage. You start with 5 million children, and you say in the next two years, 2.5 of them should be in mm -hmm. school. That's the way you pass. Okay. So you build schools that will give you 2.5 million, you know, but then you have 7 million children. At the end of the day, you still have 7 point something million children out of school, and you're fed. Not that you didn't build enough schools, but you, you, your population overrode the thing you built. And that's why we are failing in MDG and SDG. It's a measure of what percentage of your people are this way. In 2005, it was that percentage. Take the issue of how many students are out of school. We build schools. But because we had too many children, even though we had 8 million children now in school, now our population of those children are gone to 18. Take 8 out of 18, you still have 10, which you were before. 10 million are still out of school. Yet you have built an old school for them, for at least 8. So those are, we need, development is not a one-way thing. You don't face only university. You have to look at the entire picture. In fact, there are people who even mm -hmm. say that, must everybody go to university? That's a good or is question. it just because of the craze for certificates? If you don't have a university degree, you are not seen to be qualified for anything. You, you remember in the days before 1960, uh, regional governments, there were different types of schools. There was modern school, there were technical school, there was some, it's not everybody that went to university. There were other areas. If, if, I'm, if I'm more, I mean, all these young people that are expert in IT. You know, you take them to a dining school for IT, not to university to go and study physics or whatever. Those are the kind of things. So we need to look at those things. How do we address our interview to match the talent of the children? Not everybody rush into university. You know, and we're almost like a waste of time for them because in Ajafa, they are better suited for other things. If our technical training is gone, technical schools are there, teacher training school, all those things are put into place, we'll absorb all these people. The university. I'm sorry to say, as our university are set up now, we will continue to run for the night. When I said a, a, a 100-meter journey, you are turning into a marathon. This is going to be a marathon for us. We will never find a solution to it because we keep building this university like we're building them. You are also former president of the National Academy of Sciences of Nigeria. Yeah. And there is this conversation about STEM, that is the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which do not seem to be given the kind of attention that they deserve. Instead, it's more of sometimes the liberal arts or the languages and what have you. Is this something that worries you? 
Yeah, definitely. I think one of the greatest problems we have is the fact that we do not, we do not see science as, a, as an opportunity to, for advancement. It, it's a vehicle for advancement. Now, those are the countries that are making advances in the Again, I keep going back to COVID vaccine. It was all those people who did the MRE technology who improved on that. They invested in it. See the money they are reaping. The return on investment on research is almost like Six, 160 times what you put into it. The genomic studies, the uh, vaccine they are producing, they're making and reaping millions of, of, of dollars or whatever out of it with the investment they put. If we put that investment into science and research, create the enabling environment for science and research to thrive, but also for the scientists to look at this, what am I doing my science for? What's the relevance of my science? Is it benefiting the life of the people? The science that had no benefit on the people, you almost immediately, you, it's almost like of no use to anybody. I used to say something. When Pengerson, those who are carrying petrol, yes. when they decide to go on, on, on strike, if any of my leaders is in, on the sick bed, he will get up and come and answer them. When Asu goes on strike, one year later we ask him, are they still on strike? It's a matter of relevance. Yes. Because the man knows that if the petrol tanks are going on strike, no petrol, Immediate. no food, price of this go up it, because it affects his daily life. When Asu goes on strike, how does that affect whether mm, I wear a dress or not? In the Those are the things that we need to also change our orientation along that line in our university to see how do I affect the daily life of my people. The building they are living in, the clothes they are working, the roads they are working, all those sort of things. That's when only then can our science become to relevant to our people and then people will pay attention to that. Very important point you are making, Prof. But now we will go on a short break and resume the conversation after that. Okay. Welcome back. It is still 30 minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. Prof, if I come back to you, you started out as, I mean, your first area of study was veterinary medicine. Then you now ventured into virology. What made you make the switch? First of all, virology is also part of veterinary medicine. But as a veterinarian, I wasn't thinking I was going to end up in the human side. Uh, it, it, you know, when things happen, sometimes we think we are smart. But I have a belief that there's divine guidance in your life. And I'll, I'll, let me just tell you a little bit of my story. I was in ABU, uh, that was 1970, early 70. And there was this outbreak of Lassa fever in Jaws in 1969. The team that went to investigate it early in, in, in this was uh, an American team that was based in Ibadan. The veterinary school we were in ABU was also USAID project. So the Americans outside of their country always come to talk. So on their way back from Jaws, they stopped by at ABU and to see their friends. And then one of them was, oh, come and talk to my, my class was doing virology at that time. Right. And then they then came and talked to us about Lassa fever. At that time, I don't think I was interested in Lassa fever because it was 100% mortality. And I don't want to put my neck. Where are we? Well, there's so much. You know, so exactly. Yeah, so the man, when he, was, when he finished, uh, I think his name was uh, Dr. Kemp, uh, who would like to join us? Of course, nobody raised up his hand. And then he asked the question about two or three times. I was the class representative then. And I said, look, let this man go mm, and yeah. stop disturbing us. So I raised up my hand, not because I wanted to do it, but because, you know, to mm. just let it just go and let us mm. continue with our veterinary medicine. Yeah. And then he turned around and said, uh, when are you finishing? I said, I have one and a half years to go. And then he said, okay, when you finish, come and see us in the battle. I promptly forgot. And finished in ABU 71, the first part of call was not the place, was to my region, I mean to my state then. Right, because yes. Because born, yeah, yeah, born in Lisha, went to school at yeah. Bender, came to ABU. Mm. I thought I wanted to go home. So I went to my state to go and get the appointment as a veteran. And they told me there was no vacancy for us. That's what the, the man yeah. then said. So it was on my way back, sir. These are the people who say, come and see us, you exactly. know, sometime. So I, walked into, yeah, I walked into the place mm -hmm. and just said, are you ready to start? So you can see that it's not my plan. Yes. It was something I went on. Mm -hmm. But getting into the uh, I mean, to virology. teaching hospital, mm -hmm. yes. which was the only place where we were doing a lot of virology then, was not that easy. Here was a veterinarian 
coming into a medical school for human exactly. beings. And of course, we got, uh, we got treated like every profession wants to protect itself. Yes. Uh, what do you see you're doing what here? Do you we don't treat this? animals yes. here. You know, mm. This is not a veterinary clinic. But once you have your focus, I, will, I, I think I enjoyed virology. Once you have your focus and you're there, all those are side shows. And so we got in there, we became what we became, and to the glory of God, I'm where I am today. But the veterinary profession also was very important. In the veterinary school, you are taught to be meticulous. Pay attention to every, like you said, yeah. the dog is not going to tell you I have belly ache. You have to sit down and look at that dog and know where the problem is. That thing became very useful when I went into research. So I like human medicine yeah. when there's where where even an interaction yeah. In fact, you can hear from the we patient. We used to joke that yeah. the, only, the closest to the veterinarian is the pediatrician. Because the child can't say it's only the mother that tells. But you don't have anybody tells you. You just sit down there and look at the animal. Either the way it's walking or the way it's breathing, then you know where you deduce from there. And that becomes very useful when you're dealing with research. And you went on to research on, I mean, on Lassa fever mm. and what other... I actually, I started working on a virus which was first discovered in Uganda. But we also were having the cases in Benue Plateau. And so my first investigation there, we went in there and found out it was a virus, which had no name at that time. And so it was there, look, if this was causing so much problem, let's see what we can do about it. And so we then, because it was first accident in Uganda, uh, he got it by the rule then, he got the name Urungo, which is where it was first accelerated. So that was my study for PhD. But then, on a daily basis, we're the only virus lab in the country at that time. Yellow fever outbreak, whatever, anything they don't know which is a disease of unknown origin. We got there, yeah, and we said, I bought the virus. Mm. And that's why I kind of visited virtually all parts of this country and went to every situation, you know, yellow fever in particular. And as that then, of course, Lassa fever. Uh, I then went on polio, and then I then joined the WHO. We then put mm. me into doing the same thing in the African region. Right. Uh, Ebola in Kikwi, uh, Mabog in one place, yellow fever in uh, Liberia. So that, 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 was, that was the kind of opportunity. And that's, I think it's the versatility of my background as a veterinarian that made that possible for you to relate and be able to, to understand. And now we're going to what they call the One Health. In those days, we used to say it's only a human problem. It's not. Mm. We are living with animals, and they are giving us disease. Yes, interestingly, and, a lot mm. of the diseases seem to originate from animals, from Ebola, Lassa, you are and very right. uh, even COVID to some Even extent. COVID, yeah. 70 to 80% of disease that we have originate from animals. And so you begin to see the patterns of the veterinarian in that, and that's why we need to have this one health together. Not just, I'm a doctor, I'm a veterinarian. No, we can't work together. We're, we're living in the world. You find people who have animals within their houses. They have sheep, they have goat, they have this thing. They're transmitting disease among themselves. It requires all of us to work together to be able to decipher what is going on. You've been a bit critical of the handling of uh, COVID-19, mm. even mm. though in some ways you are an insider, being the mm. former chair of the expert review committee mm. on the expanded program on immunization. Mm. Um, are you more comfortable now, especially when we still hear that there may be something bubbling in China? Mm. I'm not comfortable. We haven't changed. Part of the grass we we're having and those things was that we're not making good use of the data. We're not getting proper data. You remember when we started, they said there were only three laboratories that could look at COVID. And then, you know, it ballooned to almost 100 and something. Today, half of them are no longer working. Those are some of the problems that I think we, we, we're talking about. And then when we get the data, we, we, we don't give full data to people. Incomplete data is fake news. Let's be, yeah. You get wrong decision of no out of it. If you tell me 100 people were positive in Zam Zamfara, and 600 were positive in another state without telling me how many you tested. I cannot tell you where the problem is. You must give me full information. I tested 10, two were positive in this state. I tested 10 here, one was positive in this place. Then you can look at the situation and say, look, there's more problem in this place. But when you give me only those figures, and you remember when we started, they will tell you 30 cases uh, today. But then some of those samples were collected like a week or two ago. They were positive the day you collected, not the day you not gave the, the day, result. Yeah, yeah. So if you now tell me that, you know, these were positive today, these people have been positive like two, two weeks ago, during which they were busy spreading the infection around. Could this lack of thoroughness be responsible for 
now the emergence of diphtheria of all diseases i mean things that <laughs> i mean you just can't understand where is this coming from one, failure of immunization what yeah it has to be i mean let's be frank go and check the data for nigeria uh, for the last 10 years nowhere have we gone above 50, 60 percent of the uh, dpt coverage so you're accumulating vulnerable children over a period of time. And the next two, so many years, you have so many young vulnerable. The viruses, the diseases are still around. And when you have more vulnerable people, of course, you have the epidemic coming up. One or two cases are occurring. Your system may not detect. But when you now have 10, 20 all coming at the same time, they say, ah, we have an epidemic. We've been having cases which we didn't detect. And now we're where we are today. And the whole back really is a reflection on our immunization level. If we are done ammunition properly, then we won't be where we are today. What needs to be done now to address this resurgence? Get our children challenge. vaccinated. Simple. There's no, no magic to it. But you know Get there those, is so much cultural pushback and many other things. That's where our university is coming. And I'm going to say, understand your people. I mean, you solve problems within your house, even when your children disagree with you. But you sit down and look at it. And we need to learn about our people. Understand our people. The story I read in your paper today about people going to Chatham House. I think it's stupid, it's relevant, it's, I, I don't know what word to use for it. Are the Chatham House people, are they the ones going to vote? The people who are voting are here, you are going to Chatham House to go and talk nonsense. What, sorry to use the word. I mean, to go and talk what you are talking. Here is the problem, not Chatham House. And until we get ourselves out of all that nonsense. We will never find a solution to our problem. We need to understand our people, study their way of behavior. Let me give you one final example. When, when uh, Ebola came, and cases were going on in different parts of West Africa, you know, that type of thing, until people looked at the cultural practices, Ebola was not brought under control. And what was it? In many places, when anybody dies, they wash the body as part of the burial ceremony. Yes. People go around and people are actually crying and making like this on their DC and they were getting a Ebola. Until people realized that when they said, okay, they brought you what they call something about uh, burial, something burial, I can't remember the word they used. Mm. Until they got to that level before you're able to stop that transmission. So study your people, understand what they're doing, and then we can make the difference. I mean, we overcame polio, didn't we? By getting the traditional healers and all those, mm. get involved in polio. Not Abuja sitting and telling the people, uh, as the Minister of Health, I say, if you go to that village, nobody knows you there. So go and call the man who lives with them on a daily basis to tell them what the situation is. What of Lhasa Piba? Why is it so difficult to, should I say, eradicate? Is it the interaction between human and the animals, the rat that uh, <laughs> propagated? And it's like a yearly occurrence. We can get a vaccine. There doesn't seem to be much development. We just are waiting for the time again for the cycle to happen. It's a reflection of our country. How do I say that one? We have a problem. We will not face it. We are waiting for external people to come. And it's not European that should be looking for vaccines for Lhasa. We, our researchers, all of us, should have been the one looking at that one. If we understood, the, I mean, we knew the basics of, of, of Lhasa fever. When the whole thing started in 1969 or something, we knew there was upsurge every December, December, January, whatever. And it was simple to understand. The, 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 the rodents that are responsible are called peridomestic. They don't stay there actually in the surrounding places. Come the dry season, you have a soil your food. Where the season is on there, they have food to eat in the farm, so they don't come to your house. Come the harvest season, you have a soil your greens, you put it in silos next to your house. So you are trapping them. Come. Yeah. And then you increase the contact. And then we have the upsurge. The rains come, the food is on the field, they go and look in the field, and then we say, oh, no more lasa, and we go and sleep. That is the problem. We know what our problem is. We will not take any. We are waiting for external people to come and solve our own immediate problem from. These are problems of our people. Let government put money into it and study it and get our people to study it properly. Then we'll know. Then we are talking of what our needs is, not somebody from Europe coming to tell me how my people drink Gary or don't drink Gary. Thank you very much, Professor. I can see you are just getting uh, <laughs> interesting in the discussion and you are getting heated up on yeah. something very dear to your heart. <laughs> but unfortunately, we've exhausted the allotted time for this interview. Thank it's you very much. My pleasure, sir. My way. pleasure. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Viewers, that is it. It's the end of this edition of 30 Minutes. Keep it with us.